Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. Here with uh, George, winner of the New York Open, the third annual New York Open. And we're, we've are we made it full circle. We're back on a Space Marine winning the New York Open. Space Marine and goats. <laughs> Space <laughs> goats. It's actually um, a good point. How many goats... Did you actually bring for most of the tournament? I know that you and Jason had a game, so you guys can talk in depth a little bit about that. But did you have like guiding principles for, throughout the weekend, or was there just like a a split of Zangors to sorcerers that you just never switch from? Honestly, it changed it changed game to game. Um, I was just kind of using New York as like an opportunity to test a few different things. Um, so before before going into the tournament, um, I was about ten games deep with Warp Coven. Um, so I'd mainly when I first started learning them with the new edition one, I was playing mainly rubrics. But some may call it Stockholm Syndrome from last edition. But I thought let's let's give Zangles a go. Um I was, I was always quite big on them last edition. And yeah, so throughout the tournament I ran um different loadouts basically every single match. Um so I think I ran three rubrics, three sorcerers twice, uh three rubrics, two Three sorcerers, two rubrics, two source, two zangles twice, and then then three sorcerers, one rubric, and four zangles twice as well. So a good, good, good variety. A nice even split. What did you learn from that? Are you gonna is are you gonna like trend more towards one or the other, or is the flexibility the key? Uh, so I think I think one of the biggest strengths of the team, if we're going for like a bit of a warp coven chat now is um the yeah just being able to kind of tailor your roster depending on the mission so um shout out to kill team casuals and jimmy kelly for they they did a really good um video i think a few weeks ago going over the, the basics of the team going over all the ploys and stuff um which was like if you want to get into warp coven that's a really good listen so um yeah it, it takes a few games to kind of get over the initial hill of learning all all the rules there's like nine boons you need to learn and stuff like that um so yeah so when, when when i mustered the team for each mission in uh new york open i the first thing i did was read the crit op because there are nine of them now which is really important and every single one scores in different ways so the most important thing to know is when the points are actually scored um and then i was kind of tailoring my team around that basically so for stuff where you've got to score uh, in the, uh, the during the round like loot you I, I quite like taking zangors uh for stuff that scores towards the end of the turn like upload i kind of use rubric marines to get something big and tanky on the point so yeah that, that's one of the things that people will probably learn as the edition goes on like when to take certain operatives depending on the mission and the map and then like is it i'm assuming a big factor is like the opponent that you're up against yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I played quite a variety of teams. So I played two elites, the three elites. So legionaries twice, which is a really, really fun matchup currently. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Like it's really kind of tense. Like the legionaries kind of come at you, and you're trying to like fend them off. I think Warp Coven's probably one of the best teams currently positioned to have a chance against them. Um, I played Jaegers once, Novitius once, and Phobos. Your Phobos in the final. So yeah, e- even against the legionary players, sometimes I took two Zangles, sometimes I took all rubrics. It just really depends on um, the mission, the map. Into the Dark plays quite differently to Volkus. Um, so yeah, there's some stuff you can kind of play around with and have fun. There's also, you know, a little bit of, at New York Open, we had some specific mission play around dropping stuff on midway objectives where you could block off movement with your equipment terrain. Did you ever run into that on In the Dark? 
So I played John Reese. Can you roll a crit on upload on Into the Dark? Um, so we made a gentleman's agreement not to put anything within two inches of the door. So I did take you out the razor. You were able to dodge it. I was able to dodge it. I think I only played Into the Dark once, um, once or twice. Um, just because, yeah, it's, it's interesting. But I think I think the blocking on Volcus is a lot more. It could, can be really good when you combine it with the flying sorcerer. Um, so even like move blocking, um, when you, so I'll go, I'll go back from the beginning. So I, I was taking, um, master of the immaterium on my temperic sorcerer. And for those who don't know what that does is it increases the range of all the psychic abilities it has to, by three inches. So they can heal someone within nine inches, uh, 2d3 invisible, or they can drop a temporal flux token within control range of an enemy uh, of a operative that's visible to them. So if you combine this with a sorcerer that has good mobility, so either the flying sorcerer or the one with plus on movement, you can use barricades and razor wire to set up an asymmetrical threat on turning point two and three. And that makes it really, it makes a bit of a headache for your opponent to play around this sort of like asymmetry. Because you, you go, you do your damage, and then you fly back to where you began. And then just to rub salt in the wound, you can also flip back to conceal with a uh, capricious plan which yeah that's super tough. cute yeah so, basically because you can imagine that ability as a rewind and if you add an extra three inches to the total distance you can move during the rewind suddenly you can set up charges that your opponent can't do or move it move dash take a shot or move shoot twice and then rewind into a position your opponent just cannot get to with a charge yeah it's so strong especially if you can fly over a razor wire or you can fly over barricades um yes yeah, it's, it's I, I, if you if you watch back my game with Alex, my shout out to Alex, my teammate. Um, we were on stream on game two. Uh, I managed to put a sorcerer at the top of the the Volcus Vantage, kind of like what Jason did against me with his Reaver, and I could get a temporal flux token on him, and just the the pressure he exerted um, across the whole board made it an absolute nightmare for Alex to stage. And he previously play, played played uh, against Warp Griffin before locally, and he he knows how strong some of the shooting can be so he was definitely uh definitely had a headache during that game so this gives you access to like a six inch flying melee charge that rewinds back to the top of the volcus terrain so you can like blip down hit someone and then disappear yeah very zinch uh so the one thing i discovered today actually um is if you if you if you're playing plant beacons you can't use the plant beacon action if you um if you if you remove your model and place it back somewhere else in the same activation so i, I was um thinking of maybe combining that that was, that was something i was kind of experimenting with after new york open i think i mainly took security in the new york open what you said you soon, can or you can't i don't think you can that's that's something i probably need to be clarified um so if, if you look at if you look at plant beacons don't so worry, chat. Just, we've got this we'll figure it out yeah so uh my mate dave he he messaged me to say about it so let me, let me see uh so plant beacons yeah if you look at the reds the red uh the red square at the bottom it says an operative cannot perform this action during the first turning point comma while within control range of an enemy or during Ooh, action yeah. in which it was it's very specific up. yeah no teleporting yeah so that's so yeah so you definitely can't do it if you fly but I'm hoping you can do it with temporal flux, but I think the jury's out on that. I think if you rewound yourself, because you rewind at the end of the activation anyways. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you're thinking that like you can press the button and then you... Because uh... it's at the end of the activation. So I'm, I'm yeah, I don't know how I feel about like that. You can't fly back down. You can't fly off a thing, hit someone, drop a beacon, and then teleport back. Cause no, because you places you fly. Yeah. Well, fly but, is a setup, I think. Yeah. Because fly's I, wording is you set your model back up, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and I think you set. I think you. Use, and that's an that's activation open. which it's been placed. So if you do that without flying, like if you just like charge yeah, just, fair like, and square, uh, kill someone, plant a beacon, and then teleport back. The hope, but then so. like yeah. the the wording on the teleport thing. Because if that says like you remove them and then place them it again, does say then that is a back up holy. So. Yeah, so yeah. that is well, I... an activation in which they're set up. Yeah, so that that might be one good one for the FAQ that because 
that one's pretty clear by my eye. Yeah. It's definitely something that could be FAQ'd, but like by letter of the law, that seems clear enough. Yeah, fair enough. I'm kind of hoping it works. But <laughs> well, uh, how many times did you like? Did you do security in most games, or were you noodling around with Plant Beacons at New York Open? Um, I did Plant Beacons a few times. Um, security is pretty good on some of the boards. Um, I've had a bad experience with Contain, so I know I know some people are picking up Contain with Legionaries. Um, but whenever I seem to play a board coven, I manage to score three or four points and. My opponent I think the crazy. good thing about contained is not necessarily that you're always going to score six points. It's that you force your opponent to come into your threat ranges. So for legionary, you want to play it because then people either come to your melee threats or don't. And if they don't, you're fine. But if they do, you come kill them because it like goads your opponent into awkward positions. Whereas like for warp coven, you're shooting, which is a little bit less reliable, and your melee is also a little less reliable. Would be my expectation. Yeah, the shooting's great. So just talking from the change of edition, right? So before, in the last edition, I was playing Warp Coven as three Assault Incessors with extra tricks and a bunch of goat. So it's been it's been quite fun kind of re recalibrating um, kind of the different operatives and seeing how they've changed. So a lot more of the power budget now is in the shooting. Um, so if you, like Astral Bombardment on the Mind Burn is a lot of fun on the Warp Fire Sorcerer. So for those who don't know, um, Mind burn has full seek. Um, you roll four, five attack, five dice, hit some fours. It's one, one damage, but you can also give it mortal wounds one. Um, and when you combine that with the full rerolls from a light, you can do some crazy uh, cross board shenanigans, turning point one. Um, I was playing a novitious player and I managed to snipe his banner, turning point one, with four crits. And yeah, it definitely made the game. Whoa! Yeah, after that, yeah. Well, uh, used to having him. So that like straight up killed it. Four yeah. crits. Crits. Yeah. Whoa! He, I, I did. I did. He could have saved. He could save some of the damage, but it's it's not li super likely at that point because you're getting four crits, which is four damage off the top. He's got to save three of those as crits. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. On a four up save. Yeah, with all their faith, it gets around the damage reduction as well. So I, I did ask him if he wanted the Blinding Aura, but I think a lot of people, unless you've kind of experienced the the spike once, you, people definitely are underestimating the, the kind of shock value of it. Um, so the, the, other, the other thing I did, which I found really useful as well, was I made some custom tokens for all the spell effects, and I printed out a copy of all the data cards. Um, because there's quite a lot of things to juggle with the team. So just having one less thing to worry about during the game um, helps quite a bit. And then the other big question is how do you track which sorcerer is which and which boons they have? Coding. Color coding, exactly, yeah. So what, what I was doing during the event, I, I had like a three color rubber bands. So I was just writing it manually on a bit of paper next to the next... Um, kept it for both of us to see so it was yeah i think when i was doing a couple of practice games with warp coven because for anyone who's listening i was like if i were going to go to a tournament that would be what i would want to play right now just because they're hyper complicated which seems fun but in some of the testing games i realized very quickly it's you have a lot of different timing restrictions for all of your sorcerer abilities so being able to say like this sorcerer has this thing on you until the end of your activation and on this guy until the end of my activation, having all of those visually sorted just means that you have one less thing to process. And it's not that hard with colored rubber bands and colored tokens. It's a lot, but it's not impossible. So it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like con uh, converging evolutionary thought on that. Yeah, it all, all works out. I guess we're planners. Um, so the, the other thing as well is... Um, like I kind of learned from New York Open is uh, all about the C CP budgeting. So unlike Legionary, we don't have unlimited CP, but we have lots of very good ploys that we want to use. Um, so what what I find myself doing is if you if you know you want to use Fate itself as my weapon, which is you roll two dice um, and you can use and you can use those dice to replace values in your attacks and your opponent's attacks. Um, you can use one if it's less than if the total of them is less than nine, and you can use both if the total is more than nine. Um, so if if you know you're going to be using that, I always did it first because depending on because if we got because um, depending on the board state, how how people have kind of set up and how many big crucial engagements there are, you you might only need um, one or two key rolls to kind of go your way. 
Um, so you might not need to pop um, Brotherhood of Sorcerers, which is the balance and ceaseless ploy for um, all the psychic weapons. So it's little things like that, which I kind of, when I was using during the tournament, I kind of would spend a CP on Brotherhood of Sorcerers and then not get use any, uh, not get any use out of it. So yeah, because when it comes to fate itself as my weapon, if you get a low value, you can basically curse your curse your opponent or give yourself a boon. But if you get high values, now you get like guaranteed crits twice, right? Because a value higher than nine, you're guaranteed one of them is a three, and the other one is maybe anywhere you know up to a up to a six, basically, right? Uh, yeah. If you get so a five like, or a six, yeah, Doom Bolt gets very very nasty. So, yeah exactly so like the right. fact that you have those two divergent values and not every sorcerer is necessarily going to get the use of the balance or the ceaseless from the rerolls there means that if you're expecting one or two you can just pop uh fade itself as my weapon because if you get the low values then it informs your future decisions because then you know you're not going to be able to buff yourself and hurt your or hurt your opponent you're going to do one or the other whereas if you get the high rolls you're definitely not going to need the well maybe not necessarily but it's more unlikely for exactly. you to care about the brotherhood exactly. of sorcerers. Yeah, because if you get low rolls, um, it really it's really improves your durability for one for one key key decision basically. So it's you, almost you might... like a rosary effect or just a scratch for one critical engagement. You know, Zanger goes in, your opponent thinks he's got a kill, and suddenly he just doesn't take any damage. Or it's it's like, get, gets a shot or gets shot at with a big plasma gun or a big melt, and you're like, oh, that crit, that's a one. And your opponent's like, well, that's not. That's exactly. not Exactly. Yeah, so you can, you can save a bit of CP from all this dust if you if you roll low on the, the face itself to my weapon. So. Yeah, so you have a lot of very powerful ploys. Were, do you find yourself being in a position where you were trying to farm out CP by playing a little bit more defensively and giving your opponent the initiative a lot with the new tankiness of Warp Coven? Yeah, I, I, I've I been saying to my locals that turning point two is a new turning point one. So especially for Warp Coven, so it's nice. I mean, it really kind of is, is, right? Budget. Unless your opponent's staged super aggressively, no one has been forced to commit to a point. So everyone is kind of staged out to leave some bait or, you know, you're going to have to wait for someone to come out and go do something. Yeah, it definitely depends on the mission. But yeah, that's, I've definitely got an eye to towards farming some extra CP. Turning point three is a write-off. Who who knows what the situation of the board is like? But turning point two, you can you, you can you can you can play a bit. You can play a bit more chill. Grab grab a bit of extra CP. It just doesn't hurt you. Yeah, unless you've got a incursor or Phobos player running up the mid board trying to snipe you from the edge of the board. That's very true. Yeah, I don't think I had any like crazy angles in that game. Um, I mean, there was like the incursor marksman shot through a couple of heavy walls, but. Nothing too unusual. And then you just joined me and they're like, oh, we're shooting through obscuring? Sign me up. Then the Soul Reaper put his name on the roster of people that shoot through obscuring and just killed that marksman. Easy peasy. Oh, that, yeah, it's funny seeing the, the the video clip and the photos from that little interaction today. I got a good chuckle out of me at work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I've, it's funny because I've actually never played a team that can ignore obscuring. So this is a whole whole new world to me. So, yeah, because one of your abilities is incorporeal sight, which gives you no obscurity and no saturate, right? Correct. Yeah, that's. And you yeah. just line up a doom bolt from across the map and chuck it at your opponent, and watch them melt. That would be the centerpiece of my strategy if I was playing Warp Coven. We all know that already. <laughs> well, what's great as well? So um, they they have. There is no current limit to the number of times you can cast the same spell as you saw Jason with the heal. Um, so if, if, if everything aligns correctly, you can actually double Doombolt with Psychic Cabal. So if, if someone's kind of foolish enough to give you two two targets, you can do a lot of damage with that, which is very fun. Uh, I'm curious, is the Ignore Obscuring a boon that takes up the same slot as Flying? It, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you couldn't but fly you could do, and ignore obscuring. You you could on two different sorcerers. So you, you could actually there's two different. You ways can do actually it. do it. There is an equipment yeah. that lets you cheat once. So one of your equipment choices lets you pull two boons as long as it's not a repeat boon. So if you've got either fly or incorporeal sight on the board already, you can't put both of them together. It has to be something you don't already have in play. And the other option as well is if you give one of the other sorcerers um, incorporeal sight, if he steals a doom bolt his doom bolt will be able to ignore obscuring as well so that's that's the other oh, yes the the one that has incorporeal sight if he borrows doom bolt will gain incorporeal sight 
But he doesn't borrow it from the original sorcerer. He has to have it already. Yep. So yeah, that, that's actually a really good point. The, the scrolls is amazing. It's such a good piece of equipment. I've been taking it every single game. Um, just the, the flexibility and like what, what you can do to kind of mess with your opponent as well is pretty funny. So like you could, because it gives you so many options, like you can get plus one movement, you could like ignore obscuring, you can do a free mission action, just being like, oh, I, I could do this just so it's in there kind of um, the thought process. And even if you don't use it, it still kind of presents a kind of credi credible threat that they have to play around. So that, that's been a lot of fun using, actually having good equipment to warp coven as well. Once. There is like a little bit of a backfire with the, the warp coven. Like if you think you're projecting a threat and the opponent just has no idea what's going on, then they just don't even know that you're projecting a threat because you have so many crazy things going on. <laughs> it's very very zinchin but yeah i think <laughs> as, as the team currently is like everything's a threat you can you can play the team at quite a basic level you could probably even take five rubrics one sorcerer and still do really well um but there, there definitely is that extra layer which i'm just beginning to kind of unpack and it's been been a lot of fun with the faction which is cool yeah the team has done very well on st statistics i know can you roll a crit as of recording this video just dropped his stats video i think it shows warp covenant at like a 70 percent. so i think you're right even if you're not all the way deep diving into whatever makes them good it does seem like the power budget is pretty pretty high right now and i i'm pretty sure that there is way more to the team than just like ah everyone shoot good everyone fight good and everyone spell good because like there are some combinations like the mind burn is pretty cool and it's like a niche one where it's not guaranteed to do something but if you stack it with relentless it definitely is going to do something depending on when you want to do all his dust your rubrics can now tango with a lot of things that you probably your opponent probably isn't expecting especially if you've got the power of fate itself as my weapon so if people go in for charges they get stuck and then you can fall back and blow someone up which is not a thing that you really did in the past with rubrics so there's all these lines that probably are a little bit less obvious but even with that said, it seems like the power budget is pretty there for people to just be doing generically very well with them. So if GW does a, you know, a change somewhere in the next couple months, because they're not going to change it right now from how we understand their balancing process. It takes about three months for them to decide it's time to move on. Do you think there's anything that you would uh, expect gets changed? Anything that felt particularly gross over the weekend that wasn't just a combination of you just basically putting a lot of different tools together? uh so I, th I think after three years we, we deserve a bit of time in the sun so i'm definitely on my i'm definitely on my villain arc currently locally everyone's getting sick of me playing warp coven so i'm gonna be milking it for as long as possible um but uh the, the weekend before new york open um the guys at chimera in kitchener uh shout out to james uh for putting on such a good event uh we i played uh my buddy jason just boone in the final it was his best bids he was 3-0 he he had managed to beat two Nemesis Claw and another another team, which I think was pretty good. And then yeah, just just being able to turn off turn off the piercing, which is a whole faction mechanic, the whole gimmick. It just it felt like bullying. I, I felt I felt bad for him. So I was I was actually dangling rubrics out in the open, being like, "Come shoot me, see, see what happens." And then yeah, just incredibly um, rude to dangle rubrics in front of a team that no longer gets Pierce one when they hit on fours even with the power of accurate one or two while sitting on an objective. That is, that does sound incredibly rude. And it's yeah. like, if you were to ask me from a balance perspective, those are probably the easiest rules to take away right now. It's just let Marines have a little bit of weakness, maybe restrict it down to melt the guns, go down to Pierce one. But for the uh, Pierce one things, you know, I think me and Jason were noodling idea with the idea of maybe dropping it down to piercing crits one. So there's still, there's still room for it to do something compared to what it is right now, which is just, it's just like you press the button, your opponent goes, okay, I guess I lose. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just feel, feels bad, isn't it, for certain factions? And... There's like so much interesting nuance that comes in if crit piercing one joins the list. So it's like uh, piercing two goes down to piercing one, goes down to crit piercing one. Now all of a sudden, like shooting a plasma gun, it's like piercing one, but like only on crits. Now all of a sudden, like supercharging your plasmas back on the menu because that lethal five crit piercing one would be like insanely worthwhile for like shooting into Nurgle and and lead and warp coven, um, and I think there would just be like so much more nuance, um, and it would still just be amazing in the matchup against novitiates because that crit piercing one with the faith points that essentially makes it piercing one is now like ignored 
Um, cause we got to do everything we can to say, hold your horses, novitiates, play, play a fair game. Yeah. I can see that. I can see that working or, or making it, or making that the base, for base, um, the base mechanic and maybe some sort of condition to get full piercing. I don't know. Or up the cost or something or yeah, there's, 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 there's some design space. I can definitely explore that. So it's still very early in the, in the edition. At least, at least we're not playing with. Uh, four custodies in your back line after, after that's true one. i mean it's really funny this actually this conversation came up a couple times this weekend is people talking about like how broken was the first like the last edition of kill team how bad was that release really and people just do not know how bad the custodies really were because it was they were monstrous back in the day four four apl custodies hitting on twos ignoring injuries ignoring stun ignoring crits with like invulns and the ability to just five seven people in melee or three five pierce one. <laughs> it's crazy like, times. And, and double the parry. This with the with the three fusion grenades, the the the, the vet guard with the three crap yeah. grenades and everything. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, I honestly think it would be very funny for someone to play against release like last editions release custodies against whatever they think is broken right now. Like the matchup between legionary and release custodies, I don't even think is that close because you just take your your shield and you just run at your opponent and one of them actually starts the game and does a move beforehand after repositioned and is now fully like in your opponent's board it's definitely wild times wild west um but that's a really good point actually the, the differences between the the two editions um so i i when i first picked up the new edition uh, I, I lost my first, I think, six or seven games in a row. I was like, I suck. This edition sucks. Like, I really don't like it. I don't understand it. It just wasn't clicking for me at all. Um, so I was playing a bit of Te- Tempest and Scions. I was playing some Vespids, played a bit of Corsairs. Um, so just there's quite a lot to unlearn from the last edition, just with the, the, the new nine missions, when you need to score, and just sticking around till turning point four and just the, the whole new dam- dynamic of turning point one has been an interesting thing to explore these past few weeks. Yeah, it really is just a, an entirely new edition because all of your old learning is basically gone. Like every time someone talks as if they can just stage on points because people have to interact with them, you know they're thinking about on turn one in the last edition. And all of that stuff is just like, just go and check it out the window. Whether or not not having to play on turn one is a good or bad thing, I don't actually I don't actually know. But you really just can't expect that people are going to be where you want them to be at the opening of turn two because they're probably not going to be. Yeah, that's my that's my little theory about why why people might be struggling into elites a little bit if they're kind of used to running their their operatives forward, um, giving them giving them stuff to hit and punch turning point two. So maybe a little bit more of a kind of a cautious approach. Thank, like if you move only a few select operatives that can score, it might be something to something to try. And also the the lethal five up and anything that gives um, crits, like Jason mentioned, um, it kind of acts as pseudo piercing because they need either two set normal saves or one crit to save that, that, that dice. So if, if you if you manage to land a few crits or have ways to retain a few crits, it definitely helps punch through that elite armor, even rubrics. So. Yeah, like the lethal five rending combo is like the ultimate secret weapon. If you can spam that, you can kill the meta menaces. Yeah, one of my big projects has been to find a new high tempo team or way to play because there used to be an incredibly high tempo way to play Phobos. And that is completely I think it's completely dead. Um, It's just like totally gone. I don't know, maybe. Um but I've been looking into Blades of Cain as like the new high tempo craziness. It's been a lot of fun and I don't think I'm going to have time to like crack that code in time for worlds. But um, I think it would be a big shake up if you can like force violence on turn one. People just like and ha- and have an answer for it. People are going to be not ready for that. Um, also, on that note, one thing that I've noticed with all of the like top meta teams, if you can like hyper compress violence into a single turning point and like sustain it 
you can outdo everybody because everybody has their like once per turning point shenanigans where like fate itself is my weapon is going to help you in like one or two clutch interactions. And if you're like super cagey and you only have one or two clutch interactions and it's skewed heavily in your favor, that's amazing. And that's part of why they're so powerful. And like Phobos, if you're going to drip feed threats, I'm going to Omni scramble and destroy you. But I think we both have the same weakness and both need to have a plan for this where if someone like all just assault intercessors running up with chain swords and they just stage like absolute insanity and like you can't just crack them in a single activation and they run out and they just start like mulching people and getting away with it um and then they're just like raw stats with like duelist and all that is just like insanely efficient and if they can just compress it all into one just ultra violent turn that's that's pretty scary for phobos and i think it's probably pretty scary for warp coven and, and for everyone um Yep, that's, that's exactly what John did against me. He he had a we had a very kind of KG turning point two, and then it was just pure pure ultra violence turning point three. He just kind of sprung his ambush, and I had six very angry Chaos Marines right at my lines, so I had to kind of fight fight him off. So yeah, I think I think that's that's a really good point. Kind of um, when especially when you're playing as elites as well against a horde, you don't want to drip three. You don't want to drip feed your threats. You want to kind of when you when you decide to go, just push everything, because each each gun can only shoot once during a turning point. So it's like that tempo to the turn. I think that's a yeah. That's the uh, the scariest thing about why Warp Coven is the team for elites that I would expect is like the best suited after everybody learns how to play against elites because you have the option to now you have Zangors with shields, which are kind of insane. When an assault intercessor charges a Zangor with a shield, it probably will not kill that shield. Especially when backed up by the icon, which is uh, yeah. If you've got the your Zangors and they've got re rolls because they're standing next to a sorcerer, they will probably just not die to any random melee threat. And I played around with that against Higher Tech Circle, and that generally works, except for the time when your the Tesla coils or the Tesla weaves of the Necron hit a three, and suddenly you're at a six wound breakpoint, and you just instantly die. That was very frustrating. No, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's a mate. That's what makes it seem really strong, right? So you have um, three really impactful activations with the sorcerers, and then you can pad that out with chaff activations with the with the zangles, and they're just kind of impactful enough that they have to be respected because they can still score, they can still kill things. So, did you ever use the shield guys throughout the tournament? Uh, I didn't. I don't have any painted. I've got. I've got a few built for AOS. A failed launch into AOS this summer. So they're primed purple, but they need a need a touch of color on them. But um, I, yeah, I, I can see them being used as like kind of budget subductors. They're kind of pretty cool. Budget subductors. I think they, in my little bit of testing, conceptually they make sense when you need a dude who can stand on an objective or charge someone that's reasonably like mildly threatening rather than like truly threatening. And then against exactly, I think Felgor, because the nine wound breakpoint is quite annoying for them. So you just stand them on objectives for people that have to go touch them and they just don't die, which is quite nice. Especially with the damage that, reduction. What's that melee? Yeah, what's that melee profile? Yeah, it's three, four. Uh, four attacks on fours, three, four with double parry. And then if you are backed up by a sorcerer, you get, I think, balanced. It's balanced uh, or severe. You get, you get accurate one and severe, but it's only if they're fighting or if you're, or if you're supported in combat. So I don't think they get it if they're retaliating. You, can, you could just be within six. I think, but I think they have to be fighting. So I think it's only if, like, I don't think it works. Not retaliating. retaliating. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, if you're starting a fight within six of a sorcerer, you get severe. Yeah. You always have accurate one. If you're, yeah, if you're yeah. starting it. Yeah. But just like holding but people off. one is quite important for if you just need to take a charge. So you could just like have, basically oh, an nice. assault marine goes in against four or three dice with accurate one. So you're guaranteed to force your opponent to have to parry that or get double parried. So five dice hitting three, four attacks on average means that you're never killing a nine wound model to get a double parry as long as they get one hit. And you've got fake dice as well. So if, if you yeah, if you need so that like crit, basically you Zangors that. are this crazy melee. Pe- like you could take a legionary charge too and probably not die outside of the corn versions that just like instantly sh- destroy you. But like a Zangor warrior with a shield. It is pretty annoying on a four up save, especially if you ignore piercing still. If that re- mechanic remains in the game, you know, you could dangle him out there, get shot. He's probably not going to die in cover. 
And then they also get free missions. So because oh, yeah, there's Angors, if you have a shield, you can like charge him in and be like, all right, well, you're not going to die. He can't touch him. And then he's going to do something later on. So I have tr- noodled around with it. It was very good, except for the times when I think the two out of the four Zangors took three damage and then they died to accurate two with dice rolls. So that was a little annoying, but like conceptually very good against almost anything that charges in like a Phobos Reaver going into a Zangor warrior. Probably not going to kill it. Although with lethal five and balance, maybe, maybe they will still the salt. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, how did you deal with the threat compression in your game against, can you roll a crate? Um, so it was, so just to set the scene, it was on upload, I think, uh, upload is the one where you can only, you remove, you tap the point and you remove it at the end of each turning point. Then if you remove it, you never score that point again. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was that mission, which is really scary when they take Zinch operatives and they can boost their APL to four and wipe out any progress you've made during the turn. Uh, so yeah, it was, so my base, my plan was basically to score, score early and just kind of hang on basically. Um, I, I, I was lucky and managed to win the roll off for 20.2. So I gave him initiative, which kind of forced him to make the first move. Um, we had some crazy dice rolls in that game. Um, I, I brought my, my flamers, just couldn't hit his Sineshi operatives. I think I rolled lots of threes, twos, and ones. So he, he was dodging stuff, but then he couldn't make his saves. So it kind of kind of evened out. Um, and yeah, just just kind of... The thing with Legion is that they can't be everywhere at once. So if they, if they are taking security, you know they're going to have to finish in certain spots if... if they want to score their attack ops so that's one small angle you can kind of use to play well into them basically but um yeah i yeah we basically kind of went even on went even on crit ops went even on uh, attack ops and i just managed to trade a little bit better than he did with my with my dice fixing the power of dice fixing it's strong it's strong did you find yourself using it almost every turn yeah 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 okay so just it's, the just the power of those two dice was just too intoxicating to give up huh dude as, as soon as i read that ploy as soon as i read the name as soon as i read the flavor text as soon as i read the ploy i was like yeah this this i can't i can't play anything else until this team uh yeah for listeners who don't know you know george has been on the podcast another time and i was trying to bait him back then to talk about warp coven because they were bad back then but George had been playing Warp Coven for the entirety of the edition up until that point. And we'd had a couple run-ins at local tournaments on the northeast side. So I knew when this edition dropped, he was he was like, oh, I'm going to play Corsairs. I was like, you're not going to play Corsairs. <laughs> I, I, was, I was very traumatized from uh, Pathfinder's last edition. You're, you're playing against Travis and playing against uh, Voyan, who's also a very good local Pathfinder's player. Um, just... I thought I thought my my source would be in early retirement, but I had to I had to bring them out for this edition. I actually yeah, had some I few, few new ones for for worlds. I, I magnetized all the the left arms, so I'd be able Ooh. to. So you can actually do the arm switches, so that you can have the different options. Because yeah. it is super important to make sure your models are readable on the world stage. You know, you want co- we're going to you guys are going to worlds for the world championships of Warhammer. Congrats to both of you. And when you're on the world stage, you know, last year, there were definitely a couple times where there's a little bit of like friction on personalities just because there's a lot of different regions meeting up for the first time. So having that one extra layer of clarity on your models definitely is nice because then there's no argument. And like you were saying with the memory aids for the warp coven, just like no one is going to argue with you if you say like this color is going to be all the tokens. They're all labeled. You know, you can argue as much as you want, but the tokens are the tokens. Also, like if if you if every single if you use if you've got three sorcerer models, right, and you always have the same discipline for each one. So like the guy with the fiery backpack, he's always a warp fire. Like it's just easier for you to remember. It's just like one less thing to worry about. Because it's it's, it's funny because I was watching back our, our game, Jason, and I, I kind of mixed up which sorcerer was which a few times because I didn't normally run the flyer as a warp fire. So it's just kind of this even in after six rounds quite an intense two-day event even if you're like super dialed in and into the zone you, you still 
might mess things up so you, you want to make it clear for yourself so. yeah yeah that was it was like our game also like by then i was like so fried and like stressed out i was like oh man i need to uh, like i had one sergeant model that was kind of ambiguously made so that he could be any of them and then after that i came back and i was like i'm gonna make just a very very obviously an incursor sergeant a very obviously infiltrator sergeant and then i made two reaver sergeants one with the carbine and one with the pistol um and now it'll just be like this model is this and i'm not gonna like confuse myself in a moment of brain fry also just because like at the world stage to make it just incredibly super obvious like travis was saying i think is really important um so that's that's kind of been like the hobby impact on the the like high stress games it was i mean it was a really fun game but like you know i've never been undefeated all the way to the top and i was like feeling it got the camera on you as well it's just yeah it's funny yeah it's the, and the, t- the time the clock as well it's also like an extra layer of stress as well so do you do, do you think have you been um noodling around any other tech ops like uh surveillance or pretty much all of my noodling has been blades of cane after that i just came back and i was like i've played like seven games this week blades of cane and just like they can mulch a legionary uh they're pretty gnarly i mean it's you can, have to just not make mistakes a, they can averagely go into a legionary and not die and every once in a while they will kill them so it's not like basically when a blades of cane howling banshee goes into a legionary model it's just a crapshoot because both models are hitting on fours with some number of rerolls. except the blades of cane if you roll poorly they just tell you that you're done rolling dice <laughs> Yeah, so the blades can turn off the enemy rerolls, and then they also are just like natively ceaseless. So the fact that everyone's hitting on fours, but just all eight operatives for the Banshees are lethal five, and not everyone for the Legionaries lethal five, I think it actually skews pretty significantly in the favor of Banshees. And then like if uh, if you know like let's say a a, a warrior a, a Legionary warrior flips to corn, charges a Banshee, gets a bad roll, you freeze the rolls, parry first. And then just like kill them in their own activation. All right, there's some on. craziness. We gotta, we, gotta, we gotta set the stage properly because there's a couple listeners at this point who probably have no idea what is happening in this conversation amongst <laughs> this George. So Blades of Cade, if you take all Banshees, you can do two of every aspect technique. And one of the big things that shows up on Volcus, which is not super obvious if you're just playing casually, is models on top of the vantage points are generally harder to interact with by like a substantial margin. Because on Octarius... Most climbs are about four inches, so if you're standing next to a building, you can generally make it on and hit someone. But Volcus is not necessarily the case. When you're going up into a stronghold on the long side, those climbs are, what, six inches with like a two-inch two drop sometimes? So you actually cannot make it over even on a charge. And if you're going from underneath, it's definitely too far. So if you have eight Banshees, you have two models that can do fly charges, and because Banshees now move seven inches, that is a model sitting on top of a stronghold that you can't shoot, cannot charge who can charge you guaranteed which is very scary so you basically have two versions of the flying sorcerer yeah correct and and if you fail you can also hit them with a crit and leave so there's a couple dice rolls where it's like as long as you roll one crit you have a backup plan when you go in but every other situation generally you can do enough where you can kill one legionary and Jason said that they have ceaseless baked in natively. That is not true. It has to come from a strategic ploy. Which you use every turn. Extended operative. So you can bake in four dice on fours, lethal five, ceaseless, with effectively asymmetric charges, which are very, very powerful. And if you can just line up a couple moments where your opponent gets stuck, or you land your charges in places where it stalls out your opponent from hitting any of your other pre-stage banshees in the back line, suddenly you can just like send stuff up off the top of the balconies. And if your opponent doesn't handle that very well the next turn all of your other banshees move up have moved up in the last turn to restage on those exact same vantages and you just do it again yep and then the the banshees on the ground zip through the doors and then like because you can't do the fly charge and jump away so the it's kind of like your counter threats and your pressure are the vantage point banshees and then the ones that jump out of doors because if you go try to hatchway fight them they're gonna fight you first and then they can just straight up hit you with a crit and jump away before you even like do anything and that's just pretty rude um where so that makes them also pretty untouchable and if they just like jump out and i get one crit and you get three i'm just like i'm just gonna hit six jump back move block you and shoot you with a pistol 
And, like, you might take a surprising amount of damage from that, and then the only target that you have is dealing with that expended Banshee. And then, like, that's now just, like, a one-way mirror that other Banshees are going to blast through and hit you more. Um, And it is just an incredibly high tempo, foot on the gas all the time, never let go. Um, Insanity that is super fun, and I think... It's too much of a departure from what I've been doing to, like, try to risk it at Worlds. But as soon as that's done, I'm, like, going back to Banshee Town. I, I do have two two boxes of Howling Banshees in, my, in one of my uh, checkout cards. I already so, purchased uh, my hey. second box of Howling yeah. Banshees to finish this out. <laughs> it does, it does sound quite fun. It's, it's <laughs> insanity. Howling Banshees are very fun as, like, a conceptual team. Because if you take all of them, now suddenly you've got two fly chargers. You've got two people who can hit with a crit, roll back out of a fight. You've got two people who can take charges very well. And your opponent now has to manage all of that while also dealing with the crazy stun scream, which is great. Because in on in the dark, if you guard and you stun someone with a guard, suddenly your opponent is real upset because they lost an action for real. Yeah, yeah. Um, amusingly, so you, did, you, have you have you played just against elites, Jason, or have you played against any mid range or hordes? Because I've I, done. I can I can, I can I can see the problem with Blazer Kane against why they're hard against elites, but eight three APR models with all that mobility, like they must have some play against a lot of the other field yeah i think i mean i think they do hot take or yeah i I mean i i've got like the closest game i had was actually against hernkin i mean i've I've lost plenty of games um because like while i was learning the track i was just like foot on the gas um accidentally give up two double kills and then it's over um you know that's it's very easy to do that but then then i like learned from that i'm like stage throats better it's going better um played against hernkin jaegers um it was actually a newer player but holy smokes that guy was insanely good for a newer player like he was hitting me with the rot lock negotiations like every turn and i was like bro you think i would have learned by now and i was just like getting smoked um but i barely squeaked that one out and i think as long as i was like mindful of that i could it could be a little better just because like you do have the mobility to really abuse them um, I played against a, a worm blade and I was just like jumping from the midline up into the vantage where his gunners were staged and just like chopping people up and going nuts. And then like I had a banshee that did a long charge, hit one of his warriors and then did the dash away to get close enough to his Keller morph and then just like did eight damage with a splinter with a whatever uh, shrieking pistol and just like all these crazy every single banshee is a missile that is like going for a double kill and they don't all pan out but the ones that do are like insane and then like when people have to spend one maybe two activations to deal with that expended banshee you're just kind of like you're giving me more targets for the exarch who's going to jump up and double shoot expended targets yeah i think one of the more fun things about the team is you can kind of expect them to be four apl a non-zero number of times because the time that you get the free dash after you struck with the crit now you're suddenly you've charged you've dashed and then you've done a fight and done some damage and then now you have a shuriken pistol to tap someone with basically and like a ceaseless rending shuriken pistol is insanity and if you if every turn you know that there's going to be violence, you take the ceaseless shooting against ready and the ceaseless or the ceaseless shooting against expended and the ceaseless fighting against ready. And then you never, ever, ever mismatch your targets. And it's 100 percent totally possible because it's just like everyone's in your threat range for everything all the time. And if they're ready, you charge and fight. And if they're not, then you uh, move and double shoot. And you've got your X arc and your there's, one one double shoot per turn. And like you don't really need more than that. Is- there's some fun uses for the models that just survive at one or two health and slink away to do mission objectives because you can do dance of death and flip a model when you take initiative into the new into the old spot and then just run at your opponent with a full health model. So there's almost like a medic play if your opponent doesn't quite get over the hump and kill your eight wound model. So there's a lot of like fun, silly stuff you can do. And, you know, in a in a thing that maybe George, you will enjoy, you can foresee a CP during a future point and kind of switch your game plan around like, ah, if I'm going to get this on turn two or turn three, you can either stage more or less aggressively based on when that CP is going to pop up. Also, Contempt is probably the most one of the most fun ploys in the game as yeah. well. We, one of my locals, Andrew, he's a big Blazer Kane player. Um, it's it's very funny when we're playing in the same room, you just hear him shout Contempt every so often. So he, he's always yeah, contempt ready. For, contempt for any of the listeners who've never seen it is basically where you tell your opponent they are not re-rolling their dice. Whatever they got is what they got. So every time that your opponent has some poor dice, they you can just tell them that they're stuck with it and they are going to get got. 
especially good against legionary where they have ceaseless or severe or some other crazy stuff you know if you can just tell your opponent that all you're getting is the one crit and you go first with your power sword and you just knock it out of their hands you're like all right cool we're good i'm happy with this you can hit me for four and then i'll kill you aside from any um aside from blessed cane did you guys notice any other sleeping sleeper factions from new york open i don't think anyone saw novitiates coming yeah, a who's who of kind of like the obvious ones along with Novitiates. But I think Novitiates, once you've played against a player who's trying to hit all the defensive buffs at once, you see how strong they are pretty obviously because unless you can one tap them in shooting or melee, they just don't die. And then also, it's like mathematically solved that you only melt one tap them with a melt a gun sometimes, and then everything else has like a 90% chance to bounce, and they just go back to full health. Yeah, they're, pre- they're pretty filthy. Um, my, 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 pick for something that's flying a little bit under the radar is um, Exaction Squad. Uh, so my teammate Thomas, um, he has only, he's been really going in deep on them and they've got lots of fun synergies. Um, they seem like a really cool play style that's just opened up, which is pretty new. So Subductors are really good now. Um, when you combine that with like the stuns, the, the manacles, uh, they've got like lots of aura stacking. So they've got like a baby version of the, the punishing severe ploy. Um, the, the punishing severe combos so they, they got a lot of really cool um, layering buffs and synergies which are which are really which have been quite interesting to explore he yeah had a really good game against him quite recently in a tournament and got a bit lucky with the dice but it was looking dice very, very dicey for me at some point yeah, I think looking at like the top chunk of the New York Open, Hearthkin Salvagers had Dylan, one basically the US player who's been pushing them really hard. He's got his like Blitzkrieg tactics, which are quite good. Whether or not the Blitzkrieg tactics work once people know that it's coming, I think is not guaranteed to be certain. But for anyone who doesn't know, this is probably the closest thing to Jason's patented turn one aggression. And it's where you just launch your eight inch jump pack war into opposing lines on turn one because your opponent isn't expecting it. So you can move dash an 11 inch and then chuck a grenade at someone. And generally you'll hit on threes because you have spent for approximate firepower or whatever it is on Hearthkin that gives them plus one on ballistic scale. Or if your opponent is not playing ultra carefully, you've repositioned your your jump pack warrior three inches ahead of time. So you have an eight inch threat bubble somewhere around the middle. Your opponent goes a little bit too close. You just pop up next to them, hit them with the brutal lethal five plasma axe, and then chuck a grenade at someone else, which can be devastating. And then because you're guaranteed turn two by a combination of having an equipment that gives you anywhere between plus two to plus three on your, your second turn roll, then you could just do it again. But now you're a whole 11 inches up the board, which generally means you can hit anyone anywhere. So basically a Blitzkrieg tactic that leapfrogs a jump pack warrior two stages while he's holding two crack grenades that hit on threes, just like chucking people, doinking people on the head. And that he did very well with it. He only lost the one game and it was uh, against Can You Roll a Crit where he was able to get a whole one and a half legionaries at the beginning of turn one. And then the rest of the legionaries hit all of the squishy little dwarves that couldn't quite kill anything. And that was it. Yeah, half can look kind of pretty fun with all the all the, the grudge tokens as well. I think there's definitely some some play. There. Yeah, they're like a late game damage ramp team. I think a couple other teams that did well that I don't think are on people's radars at the New York Open. I think Wormblade had a four two finish, but they were in contention for the final five one record that could have stole it from Jason actually if they had been able to beat Inquisition agents in the last round. Wormblade are a team that at the moment i think look better than their more elite bespoke cousins with brood brothers just because you get to take two heroes rather than one hero and i think that the combination of the being able to like sit in hiding and come out of the tunnels ends up being very powerful and having the more powerful kelomorph who can shoot within six inches with seek is pretty strong so i think there's a couple of those teams that are sitting at the back end but right now elites definitely for as all the talk of us you know, we try to talk about how we could beat Legionary, beat Warp Coven, but until those two teams get toned down a little bit or game plans change substantially, right now those are going to... They, they are the bigger part of the meta right now. And Jason, you know, you're out here on Phobos. Do you think Phobos have any long-term legs that, you know, are sleeping under the radar? Because let's be real, it's not like Phobos are very high up on people's tier lists as it stands. Yeah, I'd be a little surprised if they got a big bump down, because, um, you know, they 
they're squishy. Uh, it does just feel like they just die, but they are so insanely good at control. Like they're they're fast. Reavers are like have the same kind of threat as banshees. Like it's kind of insane. Um, and they can just like zip all over the place and go nuts. Terror, you can just like steal objectives even from other elites. Like uh, Omni Scramble, you can Omni Scramble through the walls with the Vox Breaker. Like you, you can just like any plan that someone could have, you can just say no thanks. Um, and there's not really anyone that has any hard counter to it besides like the threat saturation. And I think there's there's ways to work around that. Um, Phobos seem really, really good and not in a way that seems like obviously overpowered. Like they don't have any tools that you can just like everyone's running around bludgeoning everyone, taking a 70 percent win rate with their their like very. <sighs> there's a lot of nuance. What about you, George? After playing against Jason and the finals for the New York Open, are you like a believer on this wild and cursor sh- chicanery that Jason's been outputting for the last two years? Oh, I want to see, I want to see Reva heavy. Go, go four Reavers, five Reavers. I think the max I ever do is three, but Reavers. Yeah, I was really impressed. I really liked the the the, the Omni scramble. It's so strong. It's it's amazing being able to do it outside of visibility. When when you when you caught me with that, that was I was like, well, okay, I can kind of see, I can see where the the power of the scenes came from now. Yeah, and I definitely combine that with just the the mobility on Volkus to get up onto that vantage point. So that's the other thing I got really lucky with as well. Like being able to, if for those who don't know, I Jason got um, a Reaver on top of a second floor, third floor vantage point, second floor in England, third floor in the US vantage point um, on the Volcus on my side of the board. So he he could charge anywhere in my deployment. Um, but luckily, I, I took a stun grenade. So one of my one of my brave goats, he managed to roll the roll the three up and stun stun the Reaver for next turn, which helped a little bit but it's still very scary yeah and then like you you staged the rubber band blink strike sorcerer uh kind of like in the back line there and i realized that if i let him do his thing he would just like dismantle my whole team one by one and there'd be nothing i could do about it so i was like i need to trade for this at all costs and i was like really wishing i had brought put brought or put a reaver over there and uh the incursor sergeant had to die for it but ultimately it panned out that was uh I that's, think that's, we we both kind yeah, of like yeah. forced the threat saturation on each other, and that game really like escalated. Yeah, it was wild, and I, my dice are very hot as well. Like I think when I ripped the 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 four natural hits with the sorry fur, then upgraded the miss with the with the thing that definitely yeah definitely definitely hurt. So the, the other thing I was thinking of as well, right? Because you, you've been plant you've been taking plant beacon, mm-hmm. so you've been you've been emphasizing the warriors. So yeah. if, if you did take surveillance. That might be an opportunity to take some more of the specialists because your your action economy, your mission economy is slightly less taxed. Yeah, because so then it's be, like be you could have one designated well. surveillance warrior, especially if it's a reaver, just zip up to the top and uh, just eyeball everybody. Yeah, I, actually, this is news to me. So this whole conversation started with a little bit of the Omni scramble, and it turns out the Vox Breaker operative can also pregenerate <laughs> start the omni scramble ability which he couldn't do in the last edition so if you're within six of the vox breaker and jason likes to trap a vox breaker in a stronghold just hanging out so your opponent can't interact with you because the it's an eight inch bubble of no rerolls, and then also a six inch bubble of if you're near me i can omni scramble you and suddenly your opponent just cannot really approach the box safely at all regardless of whatever jason puts inside that box yeah, so basically it's like the enemy's safest lane to approach. The Vox Breaker goes and hangs out there, and then there's like someone like guarding a door uh, that can fight first, and like you have got no rerolls, and I can Omni Scramble you. Um, it, it really just like gives the Phobos player an avenue for Line Breaker, just with like, yeah, it's it's pretty strong. Not quite strong enough to take down Warp Covenant at the New York Open, but it is conceptually a very strong set of plays, right, George? Yeah, it's def- I, I like the look of Phobos. I'm just sad there's only one year left of them for official play. I know, I know, we can play with them for until the end of the. Yeah, there's only one year for Warp Covenant yeah. too, so maybe they'll get their one year in the sun where they get stuck at like seventy percent of the meta, seventy yeah, percent win yeah. rate at the top of the meta for a year, and then they just sail off into the sunset with the rest of the classified teams. 
how is actually you know this is a good way good time to bring it back to the canadian scene as a whole you know you guys we've had you on a couple times how has the growth been in canada you know obviously you guys came down did pretty well at the new york open taking at least first if not some of the other top spaces with uh thomas and alexander and was there there was one more right there four of you Uh, vivek was gonna come but he he couldn't make it in the end okay so but yeah, just um, oh, but you all. We also had one other person from oh, Montreal, Gabe, I think. Yeah, Gabe, yeah. Gabe, Gabe came down and played yep. in the narrative. So shout outs to uh, show visitor Gabe who came down. So four Canadians came down to play at the New York Open. You guys did pretty well, I think, as a broad group. But how has Canada been for you in the last, I think, a year since you have been last been on here? Yeah, so we, we had that traumatic event when one of your Brooklyn natives, True, he came up to Ottawa and he stole our one golden ticket for worlds last year so as like a collective in ontario we're like right we're we're not gonna let that happen again so we we were we were determined to get a bit of payback so we've been uh we've we've been we've been yeah really really building the community like we i've yeah i honestly can't speak highly enough of the community here like everyone is so nice like so friendly and it's competitive as well like we've really improved as a as a player base um, we've also looped in uh, Shane, Ryan from Command Point um, and some of their Rochester crowd as well because the the drive is, is manageable. Like you can, you can do a GT. Um, it's like two or three hours across the border. So we've got like a, a really, really strong growing community here. Um, yeah, and like what, one of the things that we've really been kind of focusing on is just kind of developing like a, a, a kind of productive um, way of playing casual games. So instead of just trying to cross your opponent, you, you'd like take stuff back. You'd um, you'd kind of talk things out. Like you'd, you'd you'd tell your opponent your threats. So we've just kind of been kind of really trying to improve as a as a collective. Um, so we, we've really learned how to yeah, and uh, we're beginning to see some some benefits from that. It definitely great. shows like the sportsmanship of the whole team. Absolutely amazing. Everyone's just smiling and laughing the whole time. You're smiling and laughing when you see each other. You're like smiling and laughing when you're meeting new people, um, like absolutely crushing people. And like, it doesn't feel bad at all. And it's just like, it's the best thing that's ever happened to like community tabletop gaming. Like you guys are amazing. We need, we need every club to be like you guys. I'll absolutely love that. It's like an example that we should all strive for. It's like, the example, I'm like, I'm going to go into Worlds and be like, man, I got to be like, I got to be like Maple Leaf Wargaming and just be like fun and competitive at the same time. Yeah, it's been, it's been really great. Um, yeah, so it's been like a really, yeah. So I, yeah, shout, like I've been practicing a lot with um, a few players of so Vivek and Dave and Angel. I So before the GT, I think you had um, James or uh, Voyan on before their GT in July. So we had quite a few games then so that was just really useful so basically we'd like we'd set up turning point one we'd play out turning point two and then depending on what happens we'd even kind of bring it back to the original position of turning point two just to kind of look through kind of different lines so i just i just think having like just taking e- like as much ego as you can out of your practice games it, it's not it's obviously not for everyone like if, if if you want to get if you want to better yourself as a player I think I think that's quite a good way of doing it. So you you take your ego out and you just kind of look and analyze your games and the kind of the decisions you make because every single decision has some downside and stuff as well. So if if you're talking through the multiple lines, you, you begin to see them when it counts as well, which is really cool to see. Yeah, that's a really good way to practice for tournaments and learn a lot. Actually, you know, this is a good note to drop something that Jason showed me at the while he was hanging out physically is you just sit there and kind of roll dice against each other. So this is outside of actually playing. This is like a way of mentally practicing a matchup. So if you have a thing that you want to see, you can just sit down in front of yourself and just roll all the dice for yourself in front of you. So one thing that I've been doing when I do demos is I color code dice or like size code dice. So I can just roll a bucket all at the same time. So when I'm sitting there, Jason is trying to tell me that these Blades of Cain can definitely missile and kill a Legionnaire. So I'm like, oh, I might as well sit here. I'll pick up five small dice, five big dice, and I'll just roll them all at the same time. Hit, everybody hits on fours with Blades of Cain getting ceaseless rerolls. And you can just sit there and kind of like look at it and like kill them every time they kill them maybe like 30 40 percent of the time every once in a while you just get one hit and you're like oh that's not good but if you get one crit it's also like maybe an acceptable result so you can sit there and kind of like feel out your dice results that's so like an point. example of this when you're like learning yeah. a new team when you're picking something up you go look at your exaction 
subductors that you were thinking about playing and you line them up against an assault intercessor so you just roll five dice with the assault intercessor four with the shields and you just sit there and just math it out because you're always going first so you know that you're always going to double parry once as long as you get your two hits you're in business to go actually do stuff so it's a nice way of outside of just the ego check of playing in person if you want to sit there and conceptually grind out a matchup you can just kind of roll the dice yourself you can look at uh a dice generator that is a Monte Carlo simulation that rolls all of the dice for a thousand times and tells you 70% of the time you kill a model. But you can also feel out in some of these breakpoints, like how often are you actually going to hit a breakpoint by just physically doing it? That's the other big thing as well, right? Um, it's kind of, you kind of sometimes have to accept the role. Like not every shooting attack you make is going to be, like when, when that's, yeah, taking kind of, keeping kind of a cool head and not kind of, putting all your eggs into one one dice roll which might not even matter might not score you points mm-hmm. kind of just kind of accepting the dice and like it's also goes the other way as well right so um i think in like magic there's this idea of like rotty so result oriented thinking but if you even if you make the correct decision even if the dice don't go your way that way if you keep making the correct decisions look most of the time you'll you'll be proving as well yeah, it's also knowing when to take the the less obvious decision versus the more obvious decision because the pathway of the more obvious decision is going to lead you to a termination. So yeah. it's it, like magic has a lot of these fun concepts, but dice games get to apply those concepts in much chunkier fashions. Because when you go into magic, you're playing like a limited draft or you're playing a a game at a competitive level. You've got four out of your 60, 60 cards, so you've got a one in fifteen chance which means that your probabilistic chances like chunk down a lot faster. Whereas in dice games, you're rolling a D6, so it's 16% chunks. So you'll feel all of those chunks way more often than when you're trying to grind it out for, I really need this one card out of my 60-card deck. Yeah. Um, and George was kind of saying a second ago um, about making the right choices and like not... Like, don't blame things on the dice. And I think that's, like, the biggest thing that I've seen consistently among top players. And, like, as I have grown, a huge part was, like, my mind shift in, like, never, ever, ever blame the dice. And it's, like, even if it, it's, like, at the absolute highest level, it there is going to be, like, some level of blame the dice, but you still can't, like, look at it that way. Where You can't use the dice as your excuse for the loss. You can say that I lost this game because of this dice roll, but the choice was still correct. And if you're making all the correct choices, everything will math out at the end of the day. Because you're playing a probab- probability game. If you take 70% 16 times in a row, and the day that you played, you got the 30% three times in a row, so be it. There's nothing you can do about hitting the 30% three times in a row. Yeah, so it's like so. every every now and then the dice really are going to get you down. But like if you if you make choices, like let's say I have a for example a banshee uh, chop somebody and jumps away, and I'm and I'm injured, I could take a shot that's now hitting on fours versus a ready target, which is terrible. Or I could plant a beacon, which is a guaranteed point. And it's like you you got to look at choices, like taking the shot and be like, oh man, the dice failed me. It's like well, you could have made a choice. Instead, that was just a guaranteed victory point. And and there there's stuff like that. Um as well. Um what was the other thing I was gonna say? Uh I guess I'll come back to it if I think of it. You can also, when it comes down to kill team specifically, one of the ways that you can get rid of some of that risk is you play a team with more raw power in its stats. Like for as much as we're talking about taking the correct choices, when a team is good, you know, when commandos were the top of the meta. The amount of slack you have is just that much wider because your dice are better. You can fade damage dice when people come to charge you. You can forward deploy and gain points guaranteed at the beginning so you can make up those deficits really early. So there's multiple tracks at getting better. There's what you do in-game, which is you should always be making the best choices. Dice be damned. And sometimes the dice will fail you, but sometimes they won't. Sometimes you actually have to go look for a dice avenue because you've lost all these other avenues. But when it comes down to what you want to play at a tournament, sometimes you just take the better team and you say, that's the cost of wanting to be the best. Sometimes you're not going to find a way around the Warp Coven's 2-up save on a rubric and a 3-up save on a sorcerer that can flip teleport and uh, mind burn you from across the map. Sometimes you just got to join them. Sometimes you pick the cool team, the cool looking team, and then all their warriors save on twos. So Yeah, sometimes you suffer for three years. Sometimes you suffer for three years on Warp Coven, and when they're good, it's like, it's time. You crack your knuckles and you get to work. 
we've been goat farming for three years it's, a, it's been a hard second edition was hard so it ain't much but it's honest work <laughs> yeah anyways george do you have any upcoming canada tournaments that you want to call out uh that for any of our listeners in canada who want to come out and hang out at a tournament uh, get some games against some of the nicest players on this side of the continental united states or um, uh, continental north america so uh we have we've got a good regional circuit currently so um chimera games that and kitchener they run a monthly event um i try and run an event every so often um and there's a few other game stores in hamilton oakville burlington so the every basically we, we got a regional discord um i'll send jason and travis a link um if, if you're in the area and want to check it out we have a, a in our events tab we basically currently have um check I think we have an event every weekend until Christmas, until the holidays, basically, until de- until December, which is awesome to see. Um, some of them are on Saturdays, some of them are on Sundays. So, yeah, depending on travel, it, 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 it's often the time that works for everyone. And the, the scene is lovely as well. Everyone's really super friendly. They're a lot of fun. For all the listeners that are scared to get into a competitive scene, know that there's a bunch of competitive scenes of very friendly people. And as long as you go in with an open mind of you're not necessarily there to win, you're there to learn, you're there to have fun. Most tournaments at this point in Kill Team that I've seen are definitely there for that vibe. As much as it is a competitive game, if you're there to screw everyone else and not make any friends, you could do that. It's just you're going to quickly find out that it's not very fun. Yeah, for I was a basic excuse to get three or four games in in a day and just hang out with everyone. That's that's how we sit. So, yeah. All right, listeners. You know, it's th- George. Thanks for coming on, talking about the New York Open and crushing it on Warp Coven and letting Jason try to brainwash you about Blades of Cain. He, he might. He's might. He might have convinced me. So you might. You might, you might be catching me running some banshees mm-hmm. after worlds. Team not, banshee. After worlds, not before. <laughs> Um, And thank you, listeners, as usual, for listening until the end. 